Hey, this is B.J. McDonald, director of Hatchet 3. Hey, this is Adam Green, the director and creator of the Hatchet franchise, and you're listening to Morbidly Made, where the fans have control and gas-powered belt vendors. This is Sheriff Fowler, Jefferson Powers PD. SOS, repeat, SOS. We are under attack and hunting on spot. This is the National Guard's frequency, Sheriff Fowler. Did you say you're under attack? Yes, please. We need help immediately, okay? Listen... You gotta send military assistance or something as soon as possible, okay? We're, we're, we're pinned down here. We got SWAT team officers dead. We got deputies dead. We got fucking half the Louisiana Police Department is dead. Who's attacking you, Sheriff? I'm Victor Crowley. Alright you god sucking motherfucking ass clowns out there Welcome back to the Morbidly Made For one more round With Michael J And myself John fucking Rhodes Wait, Let's one go more, One more round you make it sound like this is the last show ever Well I didn't tell you yet Mike yeah. But I've been talking to BJ and Adam yeah. And we're gonna do the Morbidly Remade And I didn't want to tell you like this but um, I have been talking to one of the maid members, and they're going to replace me. So they're going to replace you. Yeah. So wait. So it's going to be me and somebody else. Yeah. I didn't give my okay to this though. So. Well, you don't need to because I'm I'm leaving and I'm going to do a show with Adam and BJ. Uh, is it going to be called the Movie Crypt? No, no, morbidly remade. Oh, so then. All right, so then I'm stuck here with the morbidly made, and then you're gonna do the morbidly remade. Yes, exactly. New all and right, improved, buddy. Right, New and right, improved. All right, all right. Don't don't pull an Alex on me here. I can't <laughs> deal with it. Mm. Uh, so, see the difference is you won't lock me out of my shit like he did though. So okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hatchet Three show. So hang on, this one's gonna be kind of fun. Yeah, well, we don't want to say totally Hatchet 3 because we did try to get Kane hotter, but um, unfortunately Who he's... Who fucking sh- stars in Hatchet 3? Right, but I'm just saying he's not going to be on this show because he's shooting a movie until July 8th, so um, he will be coming on, but it probably won't be until the week after July 8th. Um, uh, John, should we talk about the... Uh, the because I know we talked about it um, yesterday off air, but maybe um, we should enlighten the listeners as to what could possibly be happening with the program. Um, come uh, well now, since I do adjust the shooting schedule, it'll probably be as of like the week after the twentieth of July. Well, you wasted as much time teasing it as talking about it, so let's just dive into it real quick then. Okay. So what's going to happen is we all know that um, the Camp on Namer film that, that me and uh, Mr. Rhodes uh, wrote, or Rhodes King, as I like to call him, Rhodes, <laughs> um, and uh, we're actually going to be shooting it well. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rhodes King uh, has a job. And uh, his job uh, will prevent him from coming to the set for the majority of it. So that means that I'm going to be on my own. Um, So what's going to happen is uh, starting uh, the week of July 20th, we start shooting effect shots like kills and all that good stuff. So um, that's when editing is really going to get hectic for me with posts. So I'm going to start editing while we're shooting. So uh, Rhodes King here. Maybe doing the show um, with somebody filling in for me for a few weeks while I work on post for the film. Yeah, so hang on. There may be some really shitty shows coming up. Well, I wouldn't say they're shitty because I think anybody that you get 
would be a million times better than me. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Uh, There might be some really good shows coming up after these shitty shows. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yes. Exactly. Because, see, what people don't realize is I'm a pile of shit. Yeah, well, you might try and come back and just be locked out of everything. And then... Well, now, see, (laughs) again, and I just stated how I know you wouldn't pull an Alex thing, and now... um... No, I need somebody to read the news. Oh, (laughs) well, uh, you know, we can't all be Jamie Jenkins, so... Well, hey, man, Uh, that's, that's true, we all... I can't be fortunate enough to have attractive co-hosts, so. Right, because we know that I'm not that, so. Yeah, however, you did look out because you, you got one, but whatever. Yeah, of course, I'm I'm looking at your your Skype picture right now, and I, I have to tell you, it's it's doing things to me that not many things do, or not many other things have done to me in the past. Oh, my God, Mike, that's. <laughs> I'm kidding with you. Wow. Wow, that makes me almost want to quit right there. <laughs> Can't believe I put myself through this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. All right, well, first and foremost... Um, I like women. Just let's get that out there. Okay, continue. Nobody believes you, Mike. Nobody <laughs> fucking believes you at this point. <laughs> but with this show, we have two interviews for you, actually, coming up. Um, Unfortunately, I was unable to be there for the Adam Green interview. But fortunately for everyone out there, Ryan Lewis stepped up from the grave shift and he he took my place because we all know Mike couldn't fucking do it. I tried, but I have no balls. Yeah. So I just want to thank Ryan a whole hell of a lot for stepping up and doing that for us. Mm-hmm. And then right after that, we have an interview with the fucking director of Hatchet 3, BJ. BJ McDonald. Yeah, well, I'm cool with him, so we, I just call him BJ. But Right. <laughs> All right, so enough bullshit, Mike. You want to talk Hatchet 3? We could talk Hatchet 3. I mean, I figured you might want to first touch on... Did you want to talk about what you watched? Did you want to get into that at all? I suppose we could. Because I actually watched some interesting stuff since the last show. All right, well, you go first then, bud. Okay. Um, Well, I actually got into the following because Fox is now replaying that season. Um, So I watched the first two episodes um, as of this point. And um, it's an amazing show. I highly recommend you watch it, um, sir. Um, If anybody in listener land has not seen it yet, please watch it. It's a nice show with Kevin Bacon about uh, him tracking a serial... Well, they caught a serial killer, but he has this following of people that kind of like kill in his name and all that stuff. So it's very interesting. It's it's for network TV. It's actually pretty uh, pretty good for, uh, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then I finally got around to watching my uh, Criterion Collection Blu-ray of The Blob. Amazing transfer. 4K uh, remaster. Very, very good. For a 1958 movie, it looks incredible. Nice. Have you, have you ever seen The Blob? I have seen The Blob. And once again, people are probably going to hate me, but I actually prefer the remake. Ooh. Well, Dude, no, that I'm fucking not... remake is good. No, the remake, all right, I'm not going to lie. The remake is good, but the original just, I mean, it has The original's that... a classic. I'm not denying it that. Yeah, and it has that nice campiness flavor to it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, so <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, it um, I mean, and plus Steve McQueen really uh, killed it. And I mean, the scenes where the and you know where the blob is going through the um, you know, into the movie theater and all that other stuff. The good thing about the Blu-ray is it has a bonus feature. It shows some of the models that they used for that. Like, they used a lot of miniature models, like, for the movie theater and the diner scene and all that stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't have uh, guessed. I thought they had millions of gallons of fucking Jello that they were pouring through the actual theater. Well, actually, it was never Jello. It was, like, silicone. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I just took a guess. And uh, 
It was actually shot in Phoenixville, PA, which uh, really, is not, yeah, is not too far from me, honestly. I actually didn't know that, so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, I didn't know that either. I knew it was shot in PA, but I thought it was somewhere maybe closer to you. Uh, I I didn't know. Yeah, well, we know. <laughs> uh, and then aside from that. Go ahead and say your fucking cheesy ass TV shows that you've been well, no, watching. No, no, no. Well, no, I watch those every day, so that that's that's not, you know, that's not an issue. Uh, but I also did get into the third season of Falling Skies, which um, Noah Wiley of ER fame is, stars in that show. I love Falling Skies. Great, great program for uh, alien things, and it's uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, executive producer on it, and it's like you can almost tell. That, like, this season, like, the first season there was, like, no budget. The creatures were kind of, like, very just, like, uh, thrown in there, you know, whatever. Second season, the effects got a little better. Now it's, like, this season, uh, wow, he really decided to throw some money into it, so. Well, he's not exactly got much else going on, so. Well, and uh, I'm very excited for something non-horror that starts this week on TNT, uh, Franklin and Bash with uh, Malcolm McDowell uh, and uh, Mark Paul Gossler and Brecken Meyer starts this week. So very excited for that. Of course you are. You should watch it. <laughs> you have Dish. I don't watch TV. Watch TV. Watch TNT's Franklin and Bash this week. Watch it. Maybe. Like All the right. best two hours you ever spent because it's a two I, hour season premiere. Yeah, I'm not watching that. Oh. <laughs> so is that I'll, it? For your list? It. Uh, yeah, pretty much. So, yeah. All right. Well, you know, I'm a cinephile, so get ready. Uh, yep. All right. So I watched The Awakening. <clears throat> yes. Not, not bad. Um, I, I did want to watch that. I was told uh, by a very good friend that it is actually really, really good. It's, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's an interesting little ghost story. I just think that they they just kind of lost it at the end. And I'm not saying that the ending's bad, because it's not. It's just you could tell they're going for something bigger and grander and just tied everything together in this perfect little bow. And it did kind of get tied together, but you could tell it was like some half-drunk guy trying to do it in a car real quick before he came in the house. So, Wait, wait, and, wait, 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 wait. So wait, what was he trying to do in a car before he got into the house? Kill himself? No. To, that has nothing to do with the fucking movie. It, it was yeah, just... well, no, but the way that you were saying it, you're like... I don't well, fucking know. To... <laughs> well, you said he tried to get some. He tried to do it in the car before he got into the house, so it's like... Yeah, what you is know, he the, guy's, the, the guy's coming home from work and forgot his fucking anniversary, had to get a present, and it's, it's, it's a fucking metaphor, Mike. Let's move on. <clears throat> it doesn't make sense, but okay. Ah, uh, fuck. Um, I watched Dark Skies. Yes, then that, that was my recommendation, so yes. That was your recommendation, and you fucking knocked it out of the park, because holy so wait, shit. Wait, 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 before you go, before you go any further... What do you have to say about Dimension Films after seeing Dark Skies? I have nothing to fucking say about that. However, Bloomhouse, <laughs> Bloomhouse, good fucking job. But uh, the Weinsteins and Dimension were behind it as well. So, my, it's a Dimension logo across that screen. First off, I, I really don't give that much of a shit about the studios. I know you do, but. I gotta say, this is a quality fucking film, and it is a really good, um, atmospheric, scary movie. This isn't like your gore fest or anything like this. This is almost like a haunted house, but with aliens. It, it's really fucking good, and it is honestly one of the few films that have honestly, truly scared me lately. So, so good fucking job. Scared, it actually scared you. Yeah, it, it did. I'm not even gonna fucking lie. It scared me. Did you pee your pants? No, no. But I, I was a little uneasy sitting there, you know, afterwards, just uh, kind of unsettled. Like I don't know if I want to go to sleep now. So. Oh, that's a little bit of a child move, but okay. It it really struck me in that deep, you know, 
you know, when you're a little kid and you get that fear, it really harkened back to that with this movie. They did an excellent job. I'm super right. impressed. Well, no, that's good. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Actually, I'm and, really and glad to hear it. That's honestly not just me either, because I've I've recommended it on to more people, and they've had the same response. I think this one needs a lot more push than it got. It's fucking good. So, has anyone else aside from you admitted that Dimension is a good company? Probably. Good. See, <laughs> that makes me happy. All right. Anyway, I watched Jack Reacher. Meh. You're not a Tom Cruise fan? I, I, Tom Cruise is not bad. He just didn't really feel right in this role, and it just didn't quite feel right altogether. I don't know. There's just something slightly off about the movie. Oh, oh well, when we get into the news, I have some... Well, this is later about... Uh, it's not horror-related, but it's it's something about another big action star that's doing a sequel to a movie that I love that I never thought they'd do a sequel to, but that's... That's a nice little tease for coming up in the news, so go on. Oh, okay. Um, I watched The Last Stand. Yes. I love uh, that film. It just felt... I really do. It felt like a bad balance to me, but whatever. Um, it's brilliant. It's not. Yes, it is. It, no. But anyway, I watched Scream 4. Well, I had that's... a big debate about... The ending of that on Facebook, to me, it should have fucking ended with Sydney dying and the girl getting away with it, setting you up for more films, and it would have broke the whole horror movie stereotype that, or at least structure, that Scream is known for, and they didn't. They fucking copped out, so fuck you. Also uh, a Dimension film, that that is pure brilliance, so continue. It would have been pure brilliance if Sydney would have fucking died and the girl would have got away with it. No one would have fucking seen that coming. Of course not. Awesomeness. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I watched uh, Chrome Skull. You did watch that, yes. Not bad. Uh, Escape from L.A. No, yes. Fuck yes. yeah. Did you watch Escape from New York before that? No. Oh, I, I've have. seen that recently, but no, I just didn't. Um. Ooh. When you when you watched the Escape from New York, was it an HD version? Uh, I want to say it was actually. Yes, because I have the Blu-ray, so I highly recommend. When you do get a Blu-ray player, um, that's a must-buy. Okay, yes. not done yet, Mike. Sorry, I watched a lot of shit. Yes, I watched uh, the Crow, City of Angels. Oh. I don't know why so many people hate on it. It's a really good Crow movie. I'll have to watch it again. Uh end of watch. I've wanted to see that because I heard that it was really, really good. Sad ending. The the ending kind of got to me. You watched it on Netflix, right? Yep. That's what I figured. Mystery Men. Yes. Already good Lang. Comedy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A good die. Er, <laughs> a, a good day die. to die hard. Yes. All right. Not bad. I mean, it could have been better. Definitely. You're, but you're it, waiting it wasn't for bad. six. You're waiting for six. I'm really hoping they fucking save it with six. Uh, Tremors 2. Brilliant. Don't know why, but I watched it. Um, Two is good. And then I just followed it up with the normal TV shows of uh, fucking American Dad, uh, Fringe. Watched a lot of Fringe, but... How far are you in Fringe right now? Uh, Just started season three. And how many seasons are there again? Ah, fuck if I know. It's still going, as far as I'm aware. I just watched uh, it on Netflix. Cause... No, I think it's done. Oh, uh, well then, I don't know. I, w- I will get to the end at some point. Yes. But, I started watching season two of Halston. Fucking yes. brilliant. I love that show so much. If if you're listening to this, all five of you out there, uh, fucking watch Halston. Five, but okay. Fucking watch it. It's a great show. It's... A fucking sitcom that's self-aware, funny as shit, about two fucking losers that, you know, are just trying to make it in the movie industry. Kind of strikes close to home. But anyway, um... Well, first of all, I'm not a loser, and I resent that. It it has great horror elements to it. It's funny as hell, and it has so many fucking cameos in it, you, you just need to watch it. Yeah, I will watch it one of these days. You fucking better. I will. I have to. But that that is my list. Oh, 
I mean, that's pretty decent. I would say that you've watched a lot over the course of a week, say. No, that. What I do is I go back to uh, the last time we did this, and I just go up. So. I I keep a list. See, I don't because I don't watch a lot, so I don't really have to do that. I guess. Yeah, you just don't care about the fans enough to actually inform them. Well, I make a mental list, and exactly. plus, I, like you don't I said, I don't about the fans. Of course not. I, I mean, <laughs> no, I just I don't watch a lot, so it's easy for me to remember what I watch. All right. All right. Well, I guess now that we that's out of the way, we will uh, take a quick little break. No, 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 no. Fuck that. No. No. Fuck that. We're not taking a break. Let's talk. You don't want to take a break? No, I want to fucking talk about Hatchet Three. All right. You want to talk right about Hatchet Three? Let's let's just do it this way, Mike. Let's let's get into it briefly. Like it's the contagious movie of the meek. Oh, the meek. Okay. Yeah. The contagious movie of the week. We'll we'll touch upon it. We'll take a break. We'll play the interviews, and then we'll come back. Sound pl- good? You know, doable. All right. Hold whatever. on a minute. Let me. All right. All right. Hold on. I I I, I got to tell you. All right. Then if it's gonna be the, the like the contagious movie of the week, here's what we're gonna do. Because I, I didn't tell you this, but I came up with a theme for the Contagious Movie of the Week. Oh, Jesus. So, okay. All right, so now let's let's get into this now, okay? The Contagious Movie of the Week! <laughs> oh, my God. So, anyway, this show is all about Hatchet 3, so let's fucking talk about Hatchet 3 right now. Um... This will be a, a spoiler-free review, oh, so if you don't want do spoilers, uh, maybe listen a little bit to the interviews, but, I mean, BJ does have some spoilers in it. Yeah, b- no, BJ definitely does. But, so. I mean, be aware, it's not going to ruin the movie experience. However, if uh, you don't want spoilers, don't listen past that, because after that, we're going to spoil the shit out of this motherfucker. Right. All right, Mike. So, Hatchet Three, what'd you think of it? Um, well, we all know what a steaming shit pile I thought two was. Um, and it, we, yeah, I mean, if you listen to me over the the, you know, the past few years over my different incarnations of shows, you know, I have an utter disdain for Hatchet Two. I love Hatchet One, but Hatchet Two, I hate. And in my mind here, Hatchet 3 totally redeemed the franchise for me. Really? It totally did. Now, why do you say that? Because Daniel Harris was not a fucking crying, whining bitch the whole time. I'm sorry. So, but, the yeah. fact that they chose to keep it realistic in 2, and then after a traumatic event where she that's, watched that's, all these people that she knew yeah. and was starting to, like, die terribly that's, in that's, front of her... The that's, next that's, day, you don't want her to cry. You don't want that realism. It's not realistic. Do you think somebody's going to really, like, break down and cry like that? Like, nonstop? I don't think so. Really? So so when Donald Pleasance died, you, you didn't cry nonstop? Uh, maybe for, like, the first, like, four or five hours. And then, you know, it kind of broke down to, like, every time that I, like, saw something that reminded me of him, then I would break down. Okay, so you remember she was crying in the beginning. Yeah. She cried a little bit when she got to uh, uh, the fucking voodoo shop. Right. And then after that, she wasn't really crying. She was mopey, but she wasn't crying. Right, but again, I mean, she's got to just learn to, like, pick herself back up and go beat this fucker. I just thought it was realistic and could appreciate that fact. Plus, the whole film was just fun. But anyway, this is about three, and you say it redeemed itself. So what oh, it to totally you did. made it redeemable? What stood I mean, out before, I mean, without spoiling? You know, I mean, DH right there, Daniel Harris gave a tremendous performance. I I cannot, I cannot say enough. Just, uh, you know, it just showed me, like that she can act, and I mean, I I've seen that. In a lot of other performances that she's done. But Hatchet 3 just showed me, you know, I, I I mean, I always, I did appreciate her. I always, you know, did. But this gave me a whole new outlook on her as an actor and a person as well. Um, well, Zach plus, Galligan, what's plus she definitely brought in some humor to this 
film well, this time, I, I, at least. Oh, yes. No, she definitely did. Definitely did. Which, you know, it's it's a lot, you know, it's better that she can make me laugh as opposed to um, make me want to turn the movie off because she's either crying or mopey or whatever she did in the last film. Okay. Uh, Zach Gremlins guy. Zach Galligan, yes. He, <laughs> I know you're like, uh, I really don't give a shit about him. What has he done since Gremlins? I don't know why, I just can't remember the guy's name. <laughs> it's really horrible, but um, no, he definitely was great as the sheriff. I gotta give him a lot of props. Um, no, I, I totally agree there. You know, because honestly, and you know, people are gonna probably think I'm weird, but the only other thing that I saw Zach Galligan in, aside from this was gremlins really i don't think i've really seen him in anything else i think so, i have but those that's the standout gremlins right. right so it's like this for me was kind of like a departure from the billy peltzer character that he played in gremlins one and two so i was like wow this is really neat he is really good he's really like kind of coming into his own and you you know you could, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, because, I mean, in Gremlins, he played the character that was kind of like, uh, you know, kind of soft. And it's like, here, he he, ha- he doesn't really have, like, that homeliness. Like, he kind of sheds that image to kind of, you know... He's a little bit more hardened, uh, kind of cynical. You know, I it worked for the character. I liked it. Right, no, it definitely did, and I give it, you know, I give it a lot of props for that. I think that that was amazing, actually. I really do. Um, For myself, I thought the uh, tone change in it was really good. Uh, This one comes off a little bit darker. Um, It actually has elements of tension to it. It does have the elements of, of comedy, but... It was just a really good film all around. It was highly enjoyable. No, uh, the performances I, were yeah. good, but I, I thought Kane Hodder did an excellent job once again as Victor Crowley, and he actually kind of came off as really creepy in this one. Or is that just you, me? No, no, I, I totally felt that. And I mean, you know, going back to what you said with there, and I don't think this will spoil anything if I say it, and I know that, that I think... You even brought this up before, and I know that after I watched it, I felt the same way, that it does feel a lot like a Friday the 13th film. Friday the 13th, are, are, there are definitely elements that when I was watching it, like, uh, um, he's almost treated for a little bit like uh, um, Michael Myers in the first Halloween, or even like the, the creature in Alien, where it's just kind of... You get glimpses of them and stuff like that, and I, I thought that worked really well. Right. And plus, the makeup I think was was and pretty good in this better. one. Too. Yeah, oh, that was yeah, totally fucking amazing makeup. I, I mean, it's like you can tell that even though these movies get small theatrical releases and they have a cult following, it's like I think with you know as the series progresses, they keep dumping more money into the budget, so. I think if we do get a four, you know, that's even going to be above this one because they'll probably dump a lot more money into it. Well, here, here's another thing to it as well. Along that spectrum, this one, at least to me, felt a lot more epic. And I don't know why, but it definitely just had this feel of epicness to it. It was a lot grander. Right. And I know that we talked about this, or at least I mentioned it to you, that Hatchet 3 is the shortest of the three films. But it so, does not feel that way No, at it all. doesn't. And No, it doesn't. And what it is, you know, and, and, and you know, tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I, I really do feel that it, like, kind of grabs you right from that first frame and it sets you on, like, this roller coaster ride and it just keeps you vested in it until the end. No, it definitely does. I mean, it's kind of fast paced at moments but then it slows back down and there there's good nods to the other two um there's good comedic moments uh there there's definite moments of tension where you're actually worried about characters um this one did it right this one did it right in 
all the right areas for me. So, Mike, without further ado, what are you rating this? And, and not just out of a hatchet film, man, but what are you rating this, you know, all together as a, just a horror film? You want me to take all that stuff into account? Yeah. Uh, I just, what is your rating on this, Honestly? man? Honestly. I'll give it a 10. Are you, really? Really. I mean, it was good. I will give it a 10 because I'll tell you what. Watching Hatchet 3, kind of, I felt the same way as I did back in 2007 when I watched the original film for the first time. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not going to argue that, and I'm not going to lie. I'm slightly torn with my vote, so I'm going to have to... You give it a 10. I don't, but I'm going to be honest here. Uh... I'm torn between an 8 and 8.5 and I'm going to I'm going to go with an 8 probably. But Ooh. here's the thing. Yeah. Now, what was it? The last show I gave Maniac a 9. But yes. that is on a different level. That movie is different. Uh this is one that I can definitely go to the theater multiple times and see it. And I would if if I could, mm -hmm. but you know, fuck it, eight point five. You know, just even saying that and thinking well, that'll that, round up to a nine. That it, it's an eight point five. Nine. It is on par with Evil Dead. Maybe not quite as good, but are I you insane? Quarters, so eight point five. Wait, 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 wait. Before, before, because I know we're gonna go to break after this, obviously, but. Before we go to break, I just got to say this. 8.5. Do you actually think that the Evil Dead remake shit pile was better than Hatchet 3? Uh, okay. My ratings, I, I kind of base off from how I feel about them and how I will go forward with these movies. Um, You know, Maniac is amazing. I, I am going to praise that, and I've talked about it a lot. I've suggested it to a lot of people, and it is something for hardcore horror fans to own they should this one is so much fucking fun that i can't stop talking about it i want to watch it again but here's the thing i am already talking to you and pretty much when we're done i'm gonna buy the steel box of evil dead i probably won't do that with hatchet 3 but i'll definitely end up owning well, it at some point i kind of they won't have a like steel a, box for hatchet 3 unfortunately well no shit <laughs> However, I'm going to look to see if on like Etsy or something like that I can find something that somebody made for like the trilogy because that would be awesome. I like box sets. Even if it's a homemade box set, I like fucking box sets. Here's a question. So would you buy Hatchet 1, 2, and 3 on Blu-ray? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing, though, Mike. If, if you really wanted to put me on the spot, you'd say that I had just enough for one – now, would I get Evil Dead or Hatchet 3? And I know you'd get Evil Dead. So. I, I would, and that's what makes me want to put it slightly lower than Evil Dead. That's what makes me really, 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 really surprised. That, I mean, wow. Wow. Because seriously, in my opinion, Hatchet, I mean, Evil Dead doesn't hold a candle. To what Hatchet 3 did. And that is simply because of the title Evil Dead. If it was called Crazy Fucking Cabin in the Woods, you would have loved it. And you've even I don't said think that. So. Nah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but see, the thing is, it's not. So. Moving on, sir. I killed him. Drop the gun! Wait, she has something in her hand. What is it? Oh, God. It's a fucking skill. Oh. Who? Who'd you kill? They're all dead. Who's dead? Honey Island Swamp. I need an available boat unit out to Honey Island Swamp now. Hamilton, you there? I killed him. I can't. 
हूँ Right, Adam, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, I've been listening to the movie Crypt because I'm big in the podcast myself, and I was just wondering what made you get into it. Well, uh, you know, it originally it started as an idea to do for season two of Holliston that we would do just ten podcasts, like to coincide with each episode, and the more that both Lynch and I would guest on other people's podcasts. Every studio we'd go into, the manager of that studio would sort of follow us out and be like, you know, what would it take to get you guys to do one of these for us? And it's just like, we just don't have time and it's such a commitment because people want one every week and I don't know. And, but it just, I think because we do, you know, the movie crypt on the TV show as a, you know, cable access show that's a joke. It was like, it just sort of made sense. And it was like, all right, I guess we'll do it. And the other thing was the fan commentary that we did for Friday the 13th Part 4 that Paramount asked us to do was so popular. And people were always like, when are you going to do another one? So it just seemed like, you know, every now and then we'll do a commentary. And just with the access we have to all these actors and other directors, and just, it was like, fuck it, let's, let's do this. And it'll be a little bit different than the usual one because it's filmmaker on filmmaker and not just an interview. And so, uh, as you've heard, if you've been listening to it, like it's, it's very honest, it's very candid and we do just get into a lot of stuff. And I was, I don't know why, I guess, but I was really surprised at how fast it took off and got a following. Um, but, um, here we are. And I think tomorrow night we're recording our, our sixth or our, our seventh, maybe. So, right um, it's, it's definitely been fun. And it, it's, it's also cool to have a hobby again, because I don't have any hobbies anymore. And, to do something that's just for fun has definitely been cool. I don't know how long we'll be able to be consistent with it because like I'm starting another movie and Joe's starting another movie soon. So it definitely is going to be hard to keep up with it, but we're, we're trying uh, as hard as we can. Right. Right. Which leads me to another question. You guys were talking about this spiral. Um, I love the hatchet series. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy one and two that I've watched. I haven't watched three yet, obviously. But, you know, in that, do you plan on doing any other films in that vein? Because, frankly, I thought that film was a masterpiece. Thank you. Yeah, that um, Spiral and Frozen are my two favorites that I've made. Um, and, you know, again, like nothing against the, the Hazard series. They're just very different things. Um, and, you know, it just, it just depends really on sort of my mood and where I'm at and what story I want to tell. And so it's like right now I'm doing a, a sitcom and a sort of weird documentary type thing with Bing Up the Marrow. And then Killer Pizza is like a Amblin big budget kids movie. So, um, I sort of go where, where it, it takes me. And when we were finishing, like the last week of shooting Hatchet, Joel Moore showed me the script for Spiral and, because I'm such a huge Hitchcock fan. Now, originally with that strip, a lot of the like creepier stuff that's in it was not in it. And, um, but I had this sort of vision for it and Joel was totally on board with that. And, um, it was just the right group of people in the right time. And I mean, that was a movie, like I did that for free. I never got, paid really? Really? Like, that um, I just did it cause I loved it. So it's, um, but it's, it's great that more and more people are finding it now because Hatchet sort of turned into this juggernaut and viral was released uh, in theaters four months afterwards. And every time I would try to do press for it, all the questions were about hatchet. Even when spiral did festivals, I get up and first question is always, is there going to be a sequel to hatchet? And sitting with frozen at Sundance, the first question, the premiere night was first two questions were about hatchet. So and it's like, you don't want to get frustrated because it's, it's awesome that somebody would care about something that much, but it's like, can we, can we talk about this one, please? Um, so, uh, yeah, but it's, um, it just would really depend. I mean, I love that type of movie. Right. Um, unfortunately those movies kind of go under the radar though, a little bit. Um, yeah, they, they aren't do. really excited about character pieces and psychodramas and art house movies like that. But, um, you know, hopefully, 
someday there'll be an, another movie like that. And a lot of people keep asking for a sequel. And it's like, well, if you saw the movie, you would know <laughs> that the sequel would be the exact same movie. So <laughs> what would right, the point right. be? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank and you that, for watching it. Cause I love uh, that movie. Every time somebody comes through the autograph line with that movie, I stand up and hug them. It's <laughs> so rare. It's always Hatchet, Frozen, Hollis, and Chillerama, and then somebody will have Spiral, and it's like, thank you! <laughs> I could imagine, I could imagine. I, I really feel like it's going to be one of those films that down the line, it's just going to grow even more in popularity, and people are just going to completely dig it and look back on it as like a gem that, you know, wasn't given the uh, attention it deserved. Thank you. All right. Well, since, you know, we got you on here, let's do a little uh, Hatchet talk. <laughs> okay. Now, with Hatchet 3, okay, was it hard for you handing over the reins and deciding I'm not going to direct this one and handing it over to somebody else to direct? No, not not at all. Um, th- this, is, this was a very unique scenario because it was like, you know, I, I wrote it and as Everyone knows, like, the script is sort of God on a movie because that's where everything's decided, what's going to happen, who's going to say what, what the story is. So um, by writing it, I did still keep, you know, a huge amount of control. I wrote a lot of these parts specifically for the actors that play them because they're all friends of mine, and so I was able to write to their strengths. I was on set for every moment. I was in editing. I had final cut over the movie. So it really is, and, I, and most of the people who have seen it, that's usually their first reaction is like, it doesn't feel like I went anywhere, which is, which is great. And that was the goal. And none of that is to discredit BJ at all. Like the reason why we as producers decided to promote from within was because we wanted somebody who's been part of this whole thing and so that we could stay true to the vision and the story that we set out to do rather than bringing in an outside director who is now going to try to be like, well, you know, I want to put my, my spin on this and I want to change this up and I want to do this or that. There was none of that. And not just because BJ was complacent or, and did what I said, but he's been part of the whole thing. So there was never anything where we were creatively butting heads over something. Like it, it just, it just felt very natural. And we just sort of kept going. And because this one is, is so action heavy and like the scope of this one is really, really big. It was always meant because this is sort of the final act of, of this particular story. Um, it was just meant to be a spectacle. And because he's a camera operator, I feel like he brought a lot to it with that, yeah. where his focus was very much on that stuff. And it's still the same cinematographer from the first two. It's Mo Barrett, same guy who shot Spiral and Frozen and Halt and um, same makeup effects, same producers. So it's still the same group of people making the movie, and that's why it worked. So um, it really wasn't hard. Um, if I had had to walk away and just be like, you know what, like, go do your thing with it and make your movie, then, yeah, it would have been hard to kind of stand there and watch. But that's not how this went, um, and it's never how it was intended to go. So it, it just really worked out uh, great. Oh, right on, right on. All right. Speaking of this, okay, in these Hatchet films, you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of genre favorites. And you being a fan yourself, I mean, what was this like for you, getting to meet some of these people that you yourself have been a fan of and been watching for years and everything else, and suddenly they are in your films? Um, it's uh it's incredible i mean i still you know pinch myself every day because i still haven't lost that that fanboy sense of like glee and excitement over it um but the first movie it was you know it was only hard for about five minutes because you gotta you gotta do a good job but i remember the night before we started being like how how the fuck am i gonna do this like what if they say no what if they challenge me on something and say, no, I want to do it this way. Right, but they never right. did. And it, it's all about the comfort level. And again, it, it starts with the script. And I think with the first movie, Kane and Tony and Robert, they just, this was the house that they built. And they, they really liked the fact that this was a return to form to the way these movies used to be. And that was really all the movie was intended to be. It was just the slasher movie that I wanted to see. 
And I was just sort of disenchanted with the torture porn and the PG-13 and the remakes and all the CGI. And uh, um, it, 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 the movie was not expected to do as well as it did. When I first went around to studios, they were like, it's weird because it's really funny. And then all of a sudden, it is so graphically violent and it, it has to be one or the other. And I was like, no, that's the point. And they just didn't get it. And so we made it independently and I mean, the rest is sort of history. But what was interesting was after the first one came out, then whenever I would do a convention, the whole like roster of horror celebrities appearing at whatever the convention was would all come by my booth at some point to be like, you know, how, how do I get in on this? Like, what can, is there something I can do? And I think what they like about it is that they get to be front and center in, in actual parts. They get to be funny. They get to act, not just do little cameos or, you know, references to movies that they did 25 years ago. Um, it's, it's been really special for them that they get to do, you know, Kane got to show that he could act, that he can do emotion. Um, Tony Todd got to show that he's a comedian. Um, and that's also bled into Holofin where we take these people that are known for genre movies and then put them in a sitcom for the laugh track and a studio audience. And, you know, it's shot and performed like a play. It's a completely different type of medium and they never in a million years thought they'd get the chance to do something like that. You know, when you, when you decide to become an actor, like when Robert England was got the acting bug, he wasn't like, I hope that I play the killer in a random horror movie and it becomes so iconic that I'm forever known as that character. And that's all I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they all want to do more stuff and, and I've sort of been able to provide this playground and, and let people show what else they can do. And thankfully, the fans have been totally down for it. They appreciate that, and um, they really enjoy getting to see them do other stuff. So it's uh, it's it's crazy, and not a moment goes by where I don't keep thinking, is this a dream? Is this all going to end? I'm going to wake up and be telling my wife, like, I had this dream, and I, I made these movies, and I got all these mm -hmm. amazing people to be in it, and, then, and they were funny, and I made a sitcom, and, uh, like, it's just, like, <laughs> it's still very surreal. And that's exactly what I was going to say to you, that your use of these actors, I've always enjoyed the fact that they literally have something to do. They're not just a headshot or somebody walking by or, or anything like this. These are actual characters. And I'm finally getting to see some of these people that I've seen in a billion other things, like you said, 20 years ago, doing something now, you know, it's very, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's a, a mistake that a lot of, um, a lot of novice filmmakers make is they feel like by just making references that somehow they have the audience and uh, like a good example with the studio movies, they're all after the Comic-Con audience. So they're like, if we do this reference and this reference and this reference, then we'll get that crowd. And nobody gives a shit about references. Like just cause you name your characters, you know, whatever Carpenter or whatever Romero or whatever, like, it's like, that doesn't mean that your movie's good and appealing to <laughs> horror fans. Right. Like, you got to be smarter about how you do that stuff. Um, and also I think the fact that not just Hatchet, but especially Halston is very self-deprecating. I mean, nobody is better at making fun of me than me. Um, right. And I, I love to do it and <laughs> it's just fun for me. And so um, I know there's critics that get frustrated because it takes the power away. Because what are they going to say? Because I already said it myself. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, get um, but there's a great thing in Hatchet Three where Zach Galligan's character briefly goes over the plot of the first two movies and then finishes by saying that it's got to be some of the most contrived and idiotic storytelling I've ever heard. <laughs> and my character from the first two is in the jail cell behind him and you just see me give this really offended look <laughs> um, so, um, when we showed it in Boston the, uh, nobody heard the next like two minutes everybody was just laughing and clapping but it's like you know you got to have a sense of humor and you can never take yourself seriously so it's it's been really fun to do that and like um, if you saw the season premiere of Halls then there's a point where Kane is really depressed that he's not Jason and he says um, now I'm going to get stuck doing shitty Friday the 13th knockoffs by young wannabe directors <laughs> making the next icon of horror. And I look at him like a nice ad lib dick and he's like, you like that? I'm going to keep going. Um, so it, it's, I think the fans do appreciate that stuff. Um, there's some that get offended. They're like, why are you ripping on yourself, man? That's fucked up. It's like, well, dude, come on. Like, like look, look what we're doing here. Like, you got to have, you got to have fun with it. Right. You got to have a sense of humor with what you do. 
Otherwise, it just becomes far too serious. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, there's time to be serious, like Spiral and Grace and Frozen. Like, those are very serious movies. But if you're if you're not going for that, then enjoy it. Right on, right on. All right. Now, you said that uh, this Hatchet 3 is the closing of this story. Does that mean there's not going to be a 4? Um, you know, you never know. Like, this this story is will finish with this movie. And uh, it was always designed this way. I always had this planned. And um, if you seen it you can see how it all worked out and that it was planned out like this from the start um from this point forward i mean the victor crowley character of, of course there could potentially be more hatchet movies with victor crowley this story though especially the story of mary beth and victor crowley i would like to see end here um right. but there's there's there could always be more i i don't know what those movies are right now like with two and three, I always, I always knew these stories and exactly what was going to happen. So it was different, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. And if the fans want it, um, and the only reason I can say that with faith is because the distributor, Dark Sky, the studio who makes uh, these movies, they are, and you'll never hear another filmmaker say this, so it's really important. They are the most filmmaker friendly company of all time. Like they actually like horror movies, like Greg Newman, the, the president of the company, actually likes this stuff and he knows all of it and they let me make these movies for the hatchet fans they've never at any point said well how do we reach a broader audience here like we've got this great thing going and the, the movies are successful so how do we reach beyond that like maybe they're too gory maybe we should dial back on the gore and make it pg-13 or maybe it shouldn't be you know such funny dialogue and they like they've never done that and i'm in a very weird and fortunate position where these movies are, they're cult movies. It's not, you know, Saw or like Nightmare on Elm Street where they get released on 3,000 screens with $25 million in marketing. They're, they're cult movies, but it's a huge cult worldwide and they're, the fan base is very big and very passionate and very loyal and they let me make the movies for those fans and only those fans. So I always say like, well, if you didn't like the first one, why did you watch the second one? Or like, right. if you didn't like the second one, don't watch the third one. Like, we don't care. It does, we don't need you. So, like, if you're not part of this and you don't enjoy it, that's cool, man. Like, wait for the next thing. Um, but if you do like it, I, I, I feel like we, we deliver um, consistently with these. So, and and the, I just think the quality of the movies has continued to get better with each one. So, um, looking at this as a trilogy, it's, you know, you always end up going to like the Star Wars comparison. But two was always meant to be The Empire Strikes Back, and it's you know it's darker. It's a little bit more serious at times, like the, the Crowley flashback story where we tell the real story. Um, the deaths are extremely brutal and violent. But, um, it's, you know, when Empire Strikes Back came out, there were a lot of Star Wars fans that didn't like it as much as Star Wars. And then by the time Jedi came out, they were like, actually, I think I might like that one the best. <laughs> and um, when right. we did the, the screening of all three of them, um, you know, Hacker 3 is sort of meant to be our, our Jedi, but without Ewoks. And uh, it's a lot of people were saying, you know, when I, the second one first came out, it was okay, but I liked the first one better. But now seeing them back to back, like, holy shit, the second one's fucking great. And it's like, cool. Like, uh, but, you know, no matter what, everyone's going to always have their favorite. And that's, that's totally cool, too. Well, right on. Now, uh, you have gotten me extremely excited to see this film. Awesome. <laughs> I like it. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed the first two immensely. I watched them, like, frequently. As hell, we'll say. If you like both of those, I, you got to like this one. I, I, I'd be shocked if you didn't like this one. <laughs> right on, right on. And uh, lastly, Adam, before we let you go, is there anything that you'd like to say to the fans? Um, just thank you for giving me the life that I have and in, in what I get to do. Um, I my All of my career is built on my fans. I have yet to direct a studio movie like where it was for a paycheck. Um, some of these things, like I was saying about Spiral, I don't, I don't make a sense. I just do it because I love it, and I, I've chosen that where I'll still be struggling financially sometimes. Like I, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent or whatever, but um, I, it's about the art first for me and not about just grabbing another thing because it's like to pay a lot of money. And I'm only able to do that because the fans support this stuff. They don't 
steal it online. They don't bit torrent it and pirate bay it. They they care and they understand that like people's lives are at stake here and we won't get to make more movies if that's what they do. So they some people will drive two hours to see it in the theater. They make sure that they buy the DVD or the Blu-ray or they watch it the right way on whether it's Netflix or rental, whatever it is, iTunes. Um, and that's that is um, it is so appreciated. And the only reason you keep getting to see more stuff from me and from my crew because it's like it's not just me. I'm like the figurehead of it, but there's a group of people that have done all of these things together. Um, as different as they all are, it's the same core group, and it's only because the fans support it. And, and the fact that they're so loud, um, they let their voices be heard on Twitter, on Facebook, on whatever it is. Like they they believe in it and they tell the world that and that's where word of mouth starts and things spread and um i you know everyone thinks they have the best fans in the world but i I really really have the best fans in the world especially that they're so fucking nice like you go to a convention and like there'll be somebody there in a hatchet army shirt who doesn't know anybody else there and everybody else embraces them and and treats them cool like you never see the, the hatchet fans or the Paulson fans, the Am Green fans being the dicks at those things. They're always the nice people. And um, that really, really means a lot to all of us. No way one person did all this. Fuck's sake, can you stop dancing around what's really going on here? Shut up, Schneiderman. No, sir. With all due respect, whether you want to believe it or not, this has pictographic written all fucking over it. Control your deputy, Sergeant. Schneiderman, stand down. Are you kidding me? These are somebody's balls. Balls are not supposed to be hanging from trees, yet I'm finding myself looking at fucking balls, sir. That guy knows what's up. We need to get the fuck out of here and call the National Fucking Guard or some shit for the all end of fucking mouth. This whole thing could be some sort of a joke. A sick, perverse, practical fucking joke. That doesn't look like a joke to me. Well, I'm glad you could make time for us. I'm glad you guys actually have time for me. <laughs> oh, it's a thrill. I got to see the film, and it was fantastic. Oh, thank you very much, man. I'm really, I'm, it's, it's funny that everybody like the interview right now has seen it, so it's, I haven't really heard much of, uh, of people have thought, so I'm always like, well, what did you think? And, and, and in all honesty, what did you think, good and bad? Honestly, I liked it a lot more than two, but that's just me. Uh, that, that's, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> I, I love a lot of how it did change. Like the tone seemed to change. Uh, you added some tension in. Uh, I think yeah. you kind of presented uh, Victor Crowley differently, and all that I think worked so well for the film. Yeah, thank you. That's that's what I was. I was really trying to get that to go like that. Thank you, man. Yeah, uh, it was it was really good. Awesome. Yeah, I was really trying to make it make it make it more dark, more tension, and just make it very like uh, cinematic. Oh yeah, you definitely did it. It felt a lot more epic and a lot darker. Oh, thank you. That's exactly what I was going for. Thank you. And and you nailed it perfectly, sir. Yes, thank you. I just Tim Tebow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's dive into this a little bit. Um, let's do it. I've heard that you're a big horror fan. So, what's it like to not only direct a horror film, but the third in an established franchise that you've been a part of since the beginning? You know, it, it was it was actually really great to you know just to direct something that I've already been involved in with the, as a camera operator, um, because I already knew exactly what was going on and like what the what was going on the story, uh, the characters, and everything like that. Um, you know, I've shot a lot of horror movies as a camera operator, and I did, and I you know I was a camera operator on Hatchet One and Hatchet Two. Um, so it was really an honor to get to do that. And actually the fact that I could change what I wanted with the movie and do what I wanted, not just establish what someone else had done. You know, I do have to go along with the rules of the story and everything else. But when I was like, I don't want to shoot at 185, I want to shoot at 240, make it scoop. I want to shoot it in a real swamp. Um, I want to make it grittier and darker. 
Um, you know, I got to do all those elements as well as, you know, put my input into the script uh, with things that I wanted to do, such as some of the action, like, well, most of the action sequences and uh, even the ending. Really? So Adam actually gave you quite a bit of free reign with this one. You know, he wrote the whole, you know, he wrote the script and he already had a plan on what he wanted to do with it. Um, but it was great because in, in the pre-production phase of it in writing, you know, he told me what he wanted. I told him what I wanted. Um, so we kind of worked it out that way. I wrote uh, this whole middle action piece that you guys see is something that I wrote to Adam and said, this is what I really would like to put into this. Um, and usually when you do that with a writer, they'll say, oh, OK, and they don't want to do it. Um, so I thought it was really cool of Adam to actually go ahead and just put it in there, you know, basically word for word of what I wrote to put into that script and do what I wanted to do because it just gave me it gave me what I wanted to do with the, with this movie as well as some of the other bits in the movie that, I, you know, like even at the ending, you know, the the way that that all turned out. So um, he had his script; it's still Adam's dialogue, but there was a lot of input on both sides. Wow, that's that's really cool, and it definitely comes through in the final film. Yeah, I think so, man. It's it's definitely different. You said that it was your choice to kind of shoot primarily in Louisiana, so I've heard this one was kind of a rough shoot. Can you tell us about any of the challenges you guys faced? Yeah, it was absolutely brutal, um, and I knew that going into it, but the fact that I didn't, you know, the first one was shot at Sable Ranch, the second one was shot on a soundstage. You know, granted, we, we flew to New Orleans for like a day or two on the first and second one, um, to actually shoot some daytime exteriors or and, and things like that. But we never shot in a real swamp. Shooting in a real swamp in the summer is absolutely grueling because it's hot. You have tons of mosquitoes. It rains. Um, there's alligators. There's, you know, you, have, you know, people are falling out from bee poisoning, the spray they put on their body to keep the mosquitoes off. Um, but you have a crew that works down there. You know, most of our crew, the Grip Electrics, you know, Pyro guys, you know, production designers, everybody are, are all from New Orleans anyway. So they're all kind of used to having to shoot in those environments. And thank God we had them because they were like hell bent on making sure this movie got made. You know, most people would just walk because the conditions were so rough. You know, the rain just killed us. The mud was so deep. Um, but we powered through it. And, and, you know, in 16 days of shooting down there, with 16 nights of eight-hour nights, not even getting a full 12-hour days, and getting what we did was, was, uh, was a challenge. But fortunately, it comes through, and uh, I think a little bit of that challenge even kind of comes through on the actor's performance. Oh, they're great, yeah. Everybody was in to win it, you know, and uh, it was just perfect, you know, having everybody involved and ready to go. Um, everyone knew the character. You know, we'd go over the characters before we shot, and uh, we just got in there and just jumped in. Everybody was just perfect. Oh, yeah, and you had uh, some returning actors and surprise actors in this one. I mean, was that yep. kind of a thrill for you to get to work with these people? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, I've already, I already knew them before. You know, everybody that was even the surprise actors I had worked with previously before, so it was really nice to do that. Um, Derek Mears, I worked with on MacGruber whenever I did that. He's, you know, I've always been a fan of his. He's a, he's a friend and just a all around killer actor. Plus, you know, he was he's also a horror, you know, icon as just as Kane Hodder is. Uh, I knew Kane Hodder before we ever did Hatchet One because of Devil's Rejects. Um, so I already like had a previous relationship with him and Danielle Harris. I knew from Halloween 1 and 2 uh, with Rob Zombie. So it was kind of nice to go in there and, and be able to just jump in with people that I already knew, that I already had, like, an acquaintance with. It was more it was more like running around with your friends and making, you know, a movie. So you could actually just not worry about things. You could tell them exactly what you wanted to do and what the feel of the movie was and, the, and what's happening here in the situation. And we just went with it without any time to do it. So... With any other actors, it would have been really tough, because, but they were all on board. They knew what to do. They, they would jump in. We'd, we'd get two or three takes, and we'd have to move on because of the shooting schedule. Well, it works, but you mentioned Kane Hodder and Derek Mears, and, you know, the Hatchet Army would kill me if I didn't ask. Do you think the showdown <laughs> between these two guys is going to live up to everyone's expectations? I think the showdown uh, that we did uh, is going to... It's going to make people really happy, and it's also going to make people really mad. Um, and it was definitely <laughs> intentional because there is a complete, complete showdown here that uh, people are expecting. And uh, it's, you know, the way we did it was pre-planned. That's exactly how we wanted to do it. You know, me and Derek and Kane, and we talked about it, and it was just the way to go. It's, it's, it's great. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to catch some flack for that one, I guarantee it. But because, uh, you know, those who, I don't want to spoil anything right now, but – when you see it, you guys can either curse my name or say that was really funny what you guys did. Well, I, I think a lot of people will appreciate it because I was actually looking forward to that. And then when I got to watch the uh, screener you guys sent, 
Uh, it, yeah. it was a big payoff for me. I, I greatly enjoyed that part. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. But you, you yeah, mentioned... Well, I was this one, too. What was that? I'm sorry. So, you know, and, and we put a lot of throwbacks into this movie also. Like, you know, when you watch it, it's like I did a lot of Predator throwbacks, a lot of, you know, Halloween throwbacks, things like that, that you can actually see. Just putting a little touch in there, it's kind of fun. Oh, yeah, you can definitely tell those influences. So, with you yeah. saying that, what what all films inspired you while making this? Um, you know, I'm more, like, I love the horror films. Um, I'm a big fan of, like, The Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, big fan of Halloween, um, you know, a lot, lot of Clive Barker movies. I love that stuff. But going into this one, more of Aliens is my vibe. Uh, Predator stuff is my vibe. You know, you're going into some place to hunt something down, which these, is what happens in these movies. You're going in hunting this thing down. Um, and it, that's kind of the way I wanted to go with it. And also, even down to the action bits, I wanted to kind of have that feel about it. Um, so that's really why I was directing it. More is, was more of an action base. Okay. You mentioned all the other filmmakers you've kind of got to work with. I mean, obviously, Adam Green, Rob Zombie, uh, Marcus Dunstan, J.J. Abrams. Yep. I mean, there's there's a ton of these guys. I mean, uh, did any of them kind of influence how you directed this? Um, I always go, and, and I, I've, been, I've told everybody, you know, it's it's really Rob Zombie because I've got to really work on most of his movies and see his directing style. He's very, he's a huge influence on me as well as just an overall great person and great human being. Um, I love him to death. Uh, I've learned how to break the mold of traditional filmmaking with with just you know knowing his style and what he likes to do, and watching him create uh, as well as being part of creating with him. Um, so he was a huge influence on me, just watching his style. Um, so was Marcus Dunstan, to tell you the truth, working on The Collector and The Collection. Um, and just knowing Marcus, uh, you know, as a person, you know, he's just, he's, he's a great storyteller. The guy's a fantastic writer. Um, and I love, you know, being on set with him is just like a breath of fresh air because he's so passionate about what he does. So, you know, those two, it, it, those are the guys that I really look at as directors and really look up to, and, and I love them. So that's that's basically what I base that out of. And then, you know, when it comes to the visual styles, you know, it's I've learned so much from DPs I've worked with, Scott Keevan, Caleb Deschanel, Phil Parmet, Brandon Trost. You know, these guys have all taught me different styles, but all amazing styles to work with and what works in using camera movement to tell the stories and also visually, like, what you're going for. Nice. Now, do you have anything else lined up to direct? I uh, I just got done doing a thing, a, a, I mean a small thing for for the, the Dead Island video game um, that I'm cutting, and I have two scripts that I'm getting ready to start pitching to try to get uh, in the works to do. Um, yes, I'm trying to get going with directing uh, with another another idea, a second film. So uh, hopefully that'll end up happening very soon. I'm I'm really wanting to charge pretty heavily into that. Well, best of luck towards that. Hopefully we can get to talk to you again about something like that. Anytime. But- uh, if there is a fourth hatchet film, would you be interested in returning as a director? Absolutely not. I, uh, I, you know, this is the end for me for the hatchet, you know, series. Um, I've done one, two and three. I'm very happy with what I got to accomplish with, Hat- with hatchet three. Um, I feel as this is the end for me, uh, with this story, um, as well as just, you know, being me being involved with it. I, I want to move on to doing my own thing. Um, not saying that there won't be a hatchet four. Um, there can always be a hatchet four, but, uh, for me personally, uh, I'm just ready to go to do something else. That's something more of what I create and and what I want to do. Is there anything you'd like to tell to the fans? I say, you know, go in and see an hatchet three, uh, you know, go in and have a good time. You know, these are throwback movies. These are eighties horror throwbacks. You know, this is, uh, this is a movie to go have just a fun time with, uh, to go in like an amusement park ride, sit down, grab your popcorn, kick your feet up, watch the blood fly and just have a laugh and a good time. All right. Well, thank you, BJ. And, uh, best of luck with all your future endeavors, buddy. Hey, thank you so much, man. Look forward to talking to you guys again. Same here. It was a pleasure. Take Thank care. you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. I think that went pretty All good. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cool, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it was actually a great pleasure talking to you. Uh, very informative, man. 
Thank you very much, man. Yeah, it's 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 actually really fun to talk about it. I never really get to. I talk to my girlfriend about it all the time, <laughs> and she's like, "I know, I've heard the stories a billion times." I'm like, "All right, I'm moving on to something else." <laughs> <laughs> well, I really hope I really hope this one hits big with the fans. I have full faith that it will. I mean, this was a great installment, and I can definitely tell, like you said, this is kind of I think yours and Adam's way of kind of ending at least this storyline. Yeah, you know, it's that's that's that was the whole thing we wanted to try to do. Um, Adam was a little concerned about making it the last one. In in my earlier cuts of the movie, I actually showed Danielle die. Um, oh, really? You know, was this one? You yeah, you kind of see it in this one, um, but it, it's you know, Adam he got to do his producer's cut, which is basically the same thing that I cut, um, but he took it back to what the script actually had. Um, you find a lot of that with writers. Um, they'll do that, but he uh, he went in and just it changed it back to what the script was. And I was like, man, I thought it was really more emotional if we just actually showed her, you know, pass away because it was really brutal. Me and the editor were both fighting for that. But I lost that battle. <laughs> well, the way I kind of look at it is if you guys ever do make a fourth, or at least Adam, uh, that would yeah. be one hell of an impactful way to open it with her taking her last breath and then dying. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how you do that because, I mean, the guys, no one's even there yet. The helicopters are coming in, but, I mean, Christ, she's got a branch sticking through her stomach. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but, hey, yeah, it's, it's not like you haven't seen it before in other horror films where they just reamp it. Yeah, but I, I really think that would be a great way to kick it off in, in kind of in that storyline and start up another one is just have her actually die in the very beginning and then move yep. on. But Yeah, right? You know, we left, we, we, we left, uh, we left Perry. And that yep. was a, that was another thing. He's he's still there. Yeah. So well, some someone survives. <laughs> <laughs> So, John, those were some pretty entertaining interviews, wouldn't you say so? I still think mine was better. You're just jealous because you couldn't be here to talk to uh, Green, and it's not, look, it's the fault of your work and such that you could not do that. I'm not jealous, dude. That's bullshit. I'm pissed. I mean, since before we even had this show, I was saying I wanted to talk to Adam Green. How, how much I fucking like Adam Green. It's fucking Adam Green. Fucking Adam Green! I tried. It's not my fault that your schedule isn't more flexible. I, I know. I wish it was. I wish there was some way I could have been here to do it, but uh, Ryan stepped in. Ryan did a great job. So, once again, thank you to him. And, yeah, I'm just I'm just pissed that I didn't, I didn't get to uh, partake in that. Uh, well, we'll get him again, sir, I'm sure. You're, you're fucking right we're going to get him again. <laughs> but... Are you uh, are you ready to dive into this fucker? Yeah, let's dive into the. Fucker. All right, so bitches, be ready. Spoilers. Major spoilers. Yeah, fucking right, major spoilers. Okay. So Hatchet Three picks up right where Hatchet Two left off. Literally, shotgun blast. Picture comes back on. She pumps another round in and click. Uh, you know she starts to walk out. Headless, fucking faceless, Victor Crowley attacks her. She ends up kicking him onto the fucking gigantic chainsaw, starting it up, cutting him in half, and makes her way out. Fucking amazing intro. Holy fucking shit. I was sold the minute that I saw a faceless Victor Crowley attacking her. How fucking cool was that? That was pretty sweet. I'll tell you, I was not expecting the giant chainsaw. Thing. Yeah, that was fucking awesome. And then we go to her uh, showing up in the police station, getting arrested. 
And of course, no one believes her because that's a fucking crazy ass story. And we get some cool comedy where the guy's making fun of her, saying how stupid the story is that no one would fucking do that when Adam Green is locked up in a jail cell beside her and looks up all hurt and offended. And that was perfect. That was awesome. You love that. I did. I I literally laughed out loud when that happened. Were you like uh, all starstruck that like Adam was on the screen? Did you get all like giddy like a little? No, I don't get like that. But I I definitely appreciated that. That was a good shot. That was a good sense of humor. I, I, I really liked that. So what about. Okay, now here's something for you. What cameo was better? Adam Green in Hatchet 3 or Groovy? In the Evil Dead remake. Ah, oh, you... Re- Groovy. No fucking way. Fucking way. Yes, fucking no, way. No way. No. You got more time out of Adam. All you got out of Bruce was Groovy. 17 seconds is more than enough for the god of B-movies. Nope. Anyway, moving on. Um, yes. The police go to investigate. Uh... You know, they start recovering bodies. We get another cool joke that uh, the Asian guy, um, I should have. Perry. Shane. Thank you. Perry. That's his real name. Perry is, um, I don't know why I don't remember his name. Probably because I'm terrible with names. But Perry uh, is here once again. And the one EMT makes reference that uh, one of the bodies looks exactly like him. And he is like, oh, is that some kind of racial thing? Once again, I laughed out loud. I thought that was funny as shit. Um, but night comes and Victor comes back and it's fucking all hell breaks loose. Sadly, we don't get to see a lot of this. Uh, we hear most of it through the radio and the sheriff and the rest of the deputies, a lot of backup goes out to the swamp to see what the hell's going on. They get there and SWAT arrives led by Derek fucking Mears, right? How fucking cool is that? That was that was very enjoyable. I got yeah, say. and of course he takes right over, no hose bar, just go, let's go, fucking get this shit. That was cool. Um, the sheriff's ex-wife Amanda kind of shows up. She convinces uh, Deputy Winslow. Yeah, I did do some research after I was made an ass out of with the whole Perry thing. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, and they take Mary Beth out to get. Victor's daddy's ashes. And Mike, what did what did you think of this little cameo here? Which one? By uh Sid Haig. Fuck yeah, by Sid Haig. Oh, that was brilliant. That was that was amazingly brilliant. Yeah, cuz Oh. Amazing. I loved it. Yeah. Oh no, there there's no way that I mean you couldn't see that coming. That was great. And uh uh um I forget the one line, but um as soon as he shows up to the house with the one cop or the deputy and uh <laughs> uh I'll have to see if I can get that clip and throw that in here somewhere, but that was He plays really cool. a blatantly racist redneck and he's fucking funny as hell in it. I enjoyed it greatly. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I almost cheered, like I said, when he came on. It, it was awesome. Um, but from here, you know, we go back to the swamp. Everyone's getting fucking killed by Victor Crowley. And we have the showdown. Victor Crowley played by Kane Hodder against Derek Mears. Michael J. Well, we know who wins. What did you think of this, though? What did you think when you saw the setup and you're like, oh, shit, it's going to happen? What did you fucking think? I knew who was going to win right off the bat. Yeah, but how much of an epic battle did you think that was going to be? Honestly, I mean, it was good, but I think we could have had, like, a little more from, like, play between Derek and Kane. Like, I think Kane could have, like, pulled, like, one of those finish him Mortal Kombat moves where he kind of like rips, um, you know, grabs fucking Derek by the throat and chokes him and then rips his spine out. Well, here, here's the thing. Like, it started and I thought we were going to have somewhat like 
and an epic throwdown in two where uh, he actually struggled a like, little bit against the, the biker guy. And there was none of that. And it was just played straight for comedy. And I fucking loved it. Like, as soon as it went down, I was like, that was fucking cool. I laughed. I mean, right. Derek Mears and him lock up. Derek gets slammed against the wall. And he says, let's go, bitch. And Victor Carali fucking punches through him and pulls his spine down out of his stomach. Fuck yes. Loved it. So, what does it prove, John? Uh, that two fictional characters can fight each other and one of them die? No, John. It proves that the one and true Jason still has it. Oh, I never said he didn't have it. I never said he didn't have it. He is fucking amazing as Victor Crowley. Never said he didn't have it. Now, see, you know what would be the ultimate kick in the face? Um, it would be, you know, when they remake Hatchet, because you know, like, 20 years down the road, they're going to remake Hatchet. Oh, God, I hope not. What if Derek Mears plays Victor Crowley? I would laugh so fucking hard. It would be awesome. It really would. Dude... And you can't even tell me that that would not be awesome. Uh, no, that would be pretty cool, but I can guarantee you that... I don't think he uh, would. I don't think there's a chance in hell he oh, would. No. Oh, no, I think he would. I think he would just to prove, you know, that he's got that he's got it and that he can play anything better than King. He's already done that. I just, <laughs> I just said that to piss you off. I know. Anyway, know. moving on. We we can get into that later. Um. So we had that cool showdown. Um, and then we had the main characters make it to the boat and kind of hide out. They call for backup, and Victor takes his grinder and is trying to cut through the wall. Yeah, yeah that's my question too. Why in the hell? Did they move? If they would have stayed away from the hole, they would have survived. Well, here's the thing. They wouldn't have because he was slowly cutting his way in. They would have. They would have. They didn't know that. He was cutting his way in and they were... They have to use their brain. Mike. That's one thing. They that worked brain. and it made sense to me. But here's, here's the thing. This was somewhat yeah. unlike hatchet films as in there was general tension there. It worked. It really did. I was sitting there like, oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Are they going to die? Who's going to die? And then it happens. You're like, oh, fuck. Really? That was played so well. That worked perfectly. Loved it. Hmm. Yeah, I could kind of see that. I, I really, really enjoyed that scene. I That one stood out to me a lot. Also, earlier when uh, the guys were getting attacked, um... The way Victor was just kind of in the shadows and attacking, that worked really good. You dug that. I huh? did a lot. And then where fucking D. Snyder's son shoots the rocket launcher at him, completely misses him, and hits, what was that, a deputy or whatever? That was yeah, fucking awesome. Yeah. That was good. I got to give you that. That was too. good. That was good. Uh, but from here, Amanda shows up with Linslow and Mary Beth. And Victor's daddy's ashes. They go looking for him, and all they find is a fucking massacre. Shit burning to the ground, people dead everywhere. And, of course, Victor shows up. And here's where it gets interesting, people. He fucking kills Amanda. Not that shocking. She was a stupid bitch that thought she could fucking talk to him. He's a retarded mongoloid yeah, with a hatchet cross, a fucking hatchet wound across his face. That just wants his daddy. You ain't talking to that motherfucker. And Winslow freaks out and starts shooting him. And guess what? Dies. Yeah. So we're left again with Mary Beth and Victor Crowley. Showdown time. She tries to give him the ashes. He doesn't want any part of that. And fucking throws her onto a tree with a giant protruding broken limb. And impales her. She's not dead though because it's Mary Beth and she's a badass. She throws the fucking ashes on him, and a la fucking Jason takes Manhattan, Victor Crowley melts? What the fuck? 
I wonder if when they were shooting that scene, Kane was kind of like with BJ, the same way that he was with Rob Hedden during the making of Jason Takes Manhattan, where he says, dude, what is this supposed to be? No, I wonder if he got the script and just called Adam up and it was just like, were you watching Jason Takes Manhattan because you're fucking going to melt me again? Really? But, I mean, as soon as it started happening, that's exactly what I thought of. It's you know, played better, though. Kane it's on, played better. Wait, but you know what? When we have Kane on, though, that might be something that you'd want to ask. Of. Eh, maybe. But it was played better than Jason Takes Manhattan because it's a much better film. Oh, I agree and with that. you know, Mary Beth pulls herself down off of the uh, tree limb, and we kind of end with the sound of a helicopter coming in. The spotlight's starting to shine around, and she's fading out, taking her last struggled breaths. And you know what I realized? The Jill, end. And you might think that this is stupid, but here's the thing: if she would have stayed impaled to that tree, she might still be alive. But it's left open. She's not dead, Mike. Dude, she's dead. Because let me tell you something. The minute she dislodged herself, she bled. You're fucking arguing this with me when stopped. right after we watched it, I was arguing she's fucking dead, and you're arguing no, she can't be. Fucking seriously. Well, I've 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 come to, you know, develop some common sense over the last few No, years. we talked to BJ and you're like, oh fuck, she died. <laughs> yeah, so see I Exactly. So, Mary Beth very possibly dies at the end. And she is dead. Here's the thing. How do they carry on from here? Can they carry on? Will they carry on? Uh, well, we talked off air, I believe, that I think that this should just be it. This should be the end of it. I, I think that, um, I know Adam, I, I think, kind of wants to move on. From, obviously, from the interview, yeah. BJ wants to as well. Yeah. So, I, I, I just think, you know, they should do more things. I, Maybe Hollis in the movie. I agree that they should do more things. Here's the thing. I wouldn't mind seeing another one, though. But you got to bring back these people. And I'm not saying these exact people. I mean, at least have Adam producing it and overlooking the script and protecting us. you got to have Kane. I mean, I want this formula. If you got to do it again, do it right, is what I'm saying. But... I was actually thinking about this, and mm -hmm. I agree that this is the best way to end the Hatchet films. End them on a fucking trilogy on, you know, a closing statement that wraps everything up. Everything is explained. It makes sense. The end. But... Yeah, just like Saw should have ended with Saw 3, and that would have been it, and that would have been... I'm not even arguing that, because the Saw films were good. But, here's the thing. Um, I just recently got my autographed edition of hack and slash where victor crowley is the main member and it really got me thinking why does victor crowley have to completely die why not allow him to live on why not like a hatchet comic book i'm sick of all the comic book crossovers well here's the thing it doesn't have to be limited then once it's a comic book it can be the prequel it can it can go anywhere and, yeah, dude, I, I, I would fucking buy that shit. I would read that yeah, shit. That would be fucking awesome. I just feel that the comic book stuff is a cop-out. How so? Uh, just because it just seems stupid. Like, if you can't continue it in motion picture form, then why continue it? Because I want more Victor Crowley. Victor Crowley is fucking cool, and I would not mind getting me some more of that. Yeah. I think we need to face the facts that he's gone. I, I totally agree, but I just think that's a good option. And I don't know if Adam maybe possibly wants to look into the possibilities of that, but I think that would be a cool option to allow fans, you know, the Hatchet Army, to still get their, their Victor, you know, fucking taste to get it on. But, you know, I agree that this should be the end of the Hatchet films. Right. So, there it is, motherfuckers. Your spoiler-filled review. It's fucking good. You need to watch it. It is a fun, dark, funny, and sometimes somewhat thrilling, tension-filled movie. It's the movie that 
if you watched Hatchet 1, this is the follow-up that you wanted. If you're a fan right. of the fucking slasher films, this is the film that you've wanted. This is what the genre has needed. Here you go. I really don't know how else to say it. This is probably a perfect follow-up. It is, and I, I would say the same thing. And uh, if you can't see it now in theaters, then uh, catch it on uh, DVD and Blu-ray, August 13th. I do believe that it is August 13th, and I think everyone should see it. If nothing else, fucking rent this. Redbox, whatever you got to do, see this. If if you do not like it, that's fine. You're, It's not your thing, whatever. But I guarantee that if you're a fan of Hatchet 1 and Hatchet 2, just fucking buy it. You're going to want to. Just fucking buy it. Oh, dude, right. believe me. If, if, if at this point I made a rookie mistake like that and hung up on Adam Green, I would fucking shoot myself in the skull. Oh, here they are. <laughs> Hello? <clears throat> Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, thanks. Right on. Hello? 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 Okay, you guys are on. You'll have 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Great. Hey, Adam, yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. No problem. Um, before we get started, would you mind recording a drop for us? Uh, sure, what do you need me to say? Okay, just, um, uh, this is Adam Green, and then, uh, and you're listening to the Morbidly Made, where the fans have control, or you can add in, you know, you can put whatever spin on it you like, but basically, uh, Morbidly Made and stuff like that, that's... What is it, Morbid Remain? Uh, the Morbidly Made. Morbidly Made. made. Uh, wait, I can't, I can't hear you. Um, the Morbidly Made. The, the Morbid... Morbidly made. Remade. Morbid remade. No, morbidly made. As in that's morbid mor- remade. No, morbidly, like morbidly. Yeah. Morbidly remade. <laughs> Very close. Very morbidly, close. Morbidly, morbidly made. made. M- morbidly made? That's it. There you go. Yeah, it, it. It, don't worry, everybody has trouble saying this. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Okay, sorry. It's just hard to hear right now. Okay, so morbidly made. Got it. All right, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready whenever you are. Dude, I'm telling you, this may be it. I just need some crazy shit, man. So we're going on Asian male, head severed off, uh, leg cut off below the knee. I'm telling you, man. You look kind of like you, man. Oh, what? Because I'm Asian? No, dude, because you were both... Uh, yeah, guys... I, I, I get it. We all look the same, right? <laughs> it's hilarious. Asshole. Now it's time for the news. Wow. Um, well, in the opening of the show, let's start this off. It's it's non-horror, but I think it's something that warrants... Uh, Nobody cares, Mike. Yes, they do. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, made his triumphant return to the uh, triumphant? film acting. Yes, with The Last Stand, which was an amazing film. Um I think but you're full of shit. He's keeping that going with the uh, Terminator 5. He will be playing a Terminator in that film next year. But that's not the big news. The big news is one of his other 80s film properties is getting a sequel. And I never thought that I would see a sequel to this film. And it's a film of his that I enjoy immensely. Can you take a guess what it is? Uh, no. The original was made in 1988, was directed by Ivan Reitman, and co-starred Danny DeVito. Twins? They're making a sequel to Twins 
called triplets. Oh my god. Are you fucking serious? I am totally, completely serious. Arnold Schwarzenegger will be starring in triplets. He is expecting to get a script for it soon. Uh, I will not be watching that. Why? It's, it's, dude, but Twins was so good. Twins was decent for his time. It was funny, but you know what? Fucking move on, Arnold. See, Jesus. It, yeah, but now it's triplets. <sighs> Fucking shoot me. I mean, I wonder who, who they're going to get to play the triplet. Some washed up actor. Now, come on. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito are not washed up. What's the last good film they did? I don't know, but Danny DeVito <laughs> is still doing... Um, Actually, The Last Stand for Schwarzenegger. No. Nope. DeVito is still doing uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, what was the last good thing they did? Uh, you're funny. Um, and also, uh, getting on to another topic, they released the suggested retail price for the Friday the 13th Blu-ray box set. It has a suggested retail of one twenty nine ninety nine, which nobody will be paying that price. Uh, we'll be lucky, I guarantee you. First week it comes out, it will be on sale for a hundred or less. Well, that that's a good deal right there, I think. I mean, come on, you get you get, um, what is it? Nine Blu-rays, one DVD for bonus features. You get the behind-the-scenes book. You get that tin, and you get the Camp Crystal Lake counselor patch come on you can't beat that well my big thing is am i going to get anything new because i want new special features i know i'm getting high definition but i want new fucking special features and if you're not giving me that you're not really enticing me a whole fucking lot here high definition is enough though it is for some but i want something new i when i'm shelling this out i expect you to bring something new to the table that's, uh, I gotta say, for me, the high definition does it. Like, I would be totally for that. Let's see, fans of Daniel Harris will be excited to know that um, she has two movies coming out um, soon on DVD. I don't think they're getting a Blu-ray, but DVD. Um, you're getting um, this movie called, uh, what the hell was it called? I don't remember the name of it now. And I, oh, Fatal Call with uh, Jason London. That comes out uh, in a few weeks, actually. That sounds good. What's it about, buddy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just know she's in it. Okay, good news segment. Right. And, I mean, that that's good, man. Good, <laughs> good research right there. And, uh, well, I just, I know that she's in it, so I want to see it. So that's, that's really all that it cares about. Obviously, it's somebody that gets a Fatal Call. Do you think that's what it's about? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I hope it has nothing to do with that. Somebody just picked the name. And uh, her directorial debut, Among Friends, also releases on August 27th. Now, here's the thing. I've actually heard some good stuff about this one. I'm intrigued, and I do want to watch this one. So, And I believe she does do a commentary on that release. Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely checking that one out. I will be buying it. Of course you will. Um, Just like her pants. <laughs> they were a gift. A sixth grade math teacher in France has been suspended after he reportedly showed James Wan's 2004 horror flick, Saw, to his class. Uh, this will be your first horror film, he allegedly told his 11-year-old students. And uh, the father of one distraught student brought the issue to the school after his son came home, appearing vis visibly in some discomfort. Wait, 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 wait. These kids were 11, you said? Yes. Um, you figure yeah, that's six. They were sixth grade students. They were probably between eleven and twelve years old. France, stop raising bitches as kids. I mean, fucking eleven, and you can't handle saw. What yeah, the fuck? I, mean, I would have. Uh, I would have been watching it by that age. Honestly, I was definitely watching shit like that at that age. I was seeking out the hard shit around that time. A little bit older, but I was starting to really seek out the hard shit. Um, but, you know, that is whore's not for everybody. And honestly, what is your opinion of this, man? I just think it's... I mean, well, first of all, look. I don't it's have fucking a, tasteless and not I mean, cool. It, <clears throat> look, 
I don't have a problem with your, okay, if you're an 11 year old and you're watching these movies, all right, that's great. If you, well, if your parents are cool with it, then that's fine. I don't think you should be watching it in a school. Like if I were a teacher, exactly, I would not be showing that to my students. Not at all. What the fuck? That's just, ugh. that was, that was fucked up. And yeah. And you know, it also says this news comes on the heels of a similar situation in the United States where a sixth grade Georgia based teacher is being investigated for allegedly showing R rated films, including the campaign and Ted to his students. (laughs) I got no, no, I got nothing. That's just plain old fashioned, good American dumbassery. Cause yeah, there's no excuse to show that shit in school. I mean, I can understand, like, Platoon. That's got a point to it. There's a reason to fucking watch that. Fucking Ted, there's... No. Not in fucking school. You can talk about it, maybe even suggest jokingly to the kids, watch this. You don't fucking show that in school. The fuck? Yeah, that's uh, right. And uh, Oh, and just for uh, James Wan news while we're talking about this saw shit, um, a MacGyver movie is coming. That is to be directed by James Wan. And also, James Wan is set to direct Fast and Furious 7. Uh, That'll be interesting, actually. Not his normal forte, so I I will definitely be intrigued to watch it. However, um, when he stepped outside with, uh, what was that, Death Sentence? Yes. I thought that was a great film. That was, I'll tell you. And I mean, I heard a lot of people gave that film flack, but... I didn't see the whole thing, but I've seen bits and pieces. I've wanted to sit down and and actually finish it, but it does it does definitely seem like a really really good film. So, no, I I highly highly enjoy it. And if you you want a a kind of visceral action movie, right? Very good, very good. Well, I will definitely be checking that out then. Oh my god, Bad Teacher is getting a fucking CBS TV series. Oh my god. Are you fucking serious? I'm reading it. It's a and bad. and fucking people wonder why I don't watch TV. Fuck that bullshit. The movie was good. The movie was good though. I'll give you that. I never watched it. No, it is actually pretty good. Um. So, I don't know. That's that's really all I got, dude. All right then. Well, thank you for the heaping shit pile of news. I agree uh, with your statement. Yeah. I I have a general fuck you to all of that. I only have one thing to contribute. What do you got? Uh, It's a news story I read a little bit ago, and it actually has to do with the entire film industry. Um, The theater chain owners are actually asking the movie industry to cut down the length. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yes, to cut down the length of the trailers. Yeah, they cut down the length of the trailers, or at least have them not spoil the film as much because let's face facts you can pretty much go to the movies see five trailers and understand every aspect of the film pretty much right you're getting the cliff notes version now in trailers instead of just teasing you with oh that looks good i I wonder what it's really about i'm gonna i want to check that out you're just like oh this happens and that happens that happens now that's cool i don't fucking want a seven minute long trailer just giving me the entire cliff notes of the movie no i don't either i definitely don't I mean, fuck, anymore, I watch, like, the teaser to kind of get you interested, and I stop watching the trailer if I want to watch the movie. Well, this is why I told you I don't watch trailers. And people think I'm crazy, but I don't watch trailers. Yeah. That, you know, that's, that's part of the reason. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, but, yeah, that's about it. So what you got, Mike? <laughs> that's about all I got. I guess, um... I meant for thanks, asshole. Oh, I just want to thank everybody. Who listens and still supports, and uh, hopefully they will be as supportive when uh, we release uh, Camp on Nightmare in the Fall. Oh fuck! Nice, nice plug there. I, I'll be, dude. I will be plugging it from now until uh, it's released in October, and then probably beyond. All right. Well, here I want to thank uh, Dark Skies for giving us Hatchet Three. I want to thank Adam Green. And BJ McDonald for coming on and talking to us. And I want to thank The Maid for supporting us. And I want to thank everyone else out there that 
is actually fucking listening because why the fuck are you putting yourselves through this? It is immense torture for the hour and a half or two hours that we're on here. Yeah, but you know what? If you, you're enjoying it, good for fucking you. And uh, all right, I guess that's it. So we will see you uh, next week with another show. We have other stuff coming. So enjoy. Don't forget. Get on Nightmare this October. Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's it. Later. Thank you.